distributions made by the pitchers in the regular season couldn't compare to what they were able to do in a four game series against the world champions of 1965 the Los Angeles Dodgers who in his wildest hopes and dreams could have imagined what four young men would be able to do against a team that was rated just about invincible by the national press and the sports broadcasters who did the games on radio and television Wally Bunker Jim Palmer Dave McNally and Mo Drabowski Three of them are part of the Orioles' Peach Fuzz platoon. The fourth, Drabowski, was a Kansas City reject before the Orioles picked him up in last winter's draft. All this quartet did was set a new series record. From the third inning of the first game until the end, they gave the Dodgers not one run and few scoring opportunities, and they confounded the people who had run them down as mediocre. Drabowski set a new strikeout record and tied another. Palmer and McNally pitched four hitters, Bunker pitched a three hitter and while we're talking about contributions there's one man without whose contributions the birds could not have won a world championship Frank Robinson a homer in his first time at bat to break the hearts of the Dodgers a homer in the fourth game to provide the margin by which the Orioles won in between a couple of base hits a knowledge of the Dodgers a confidence that rubbed off on everybody else this man was truly the most valuable player on the Baltimore roster but especially in the World Series. Brooks Robinson, Paul Blair, Davy Johnson, Russ Snyder, Louis Aparicio, Boog Powell, Andy Etchebarren. All had a hand of some kind in bringing off the stunner of the year, a sweep of the Dodgers by the Baltimore Orioles. Now, let's look at this 1966 World Series. Let's see how a club that was poor mouthed by some as a winning team in a second-rate league took the champions of the world and left them for dead in four straight games. Remember, before the first game opened on October 5th, the Dodgers were listed by the odds makers as eight to five to win the World Series. They were two and a half to one to take the first game. And the knowledgeable people who make odds were giving 20 to one against an Oriole sweep. Remember out in Los Angeles in the first inning after Aparicio was retired, Russ Snyder drew a walk. And then Frank Robinson drilled a home run into the left field seat off Don Drysdale. Russ Snyder scored the first run of the World Series in 1966 and Frank Robinson scored the second and had both waited at home plate for a few moments they could have greeted Brooks Robinson because Brooks uncorked a shot that landed deeper into the left field seats than did Frank Robinson way up in the back and before half an inning was gone the Orioles had a three to nothing lead. Snyder advanced it to four to nothing in the second inning with a timely single that drove in a run. And then in the bottom of the second, Jim Lefevre got to a shaky Dave McNally and laced a home run for the Dodgers that made the score four to one. In the third inning, with two runners on base, John Roseboro lofted a fly up the power alley in right center field Russ Snyder made a fantastic catch on the ball and prevented what at least would have been one run and probably two Grabowski came on in the third inning with the bases loaded and proceeded to set six men down on strikes and overall through the game struck out 11 a five to two final in that first game the Orioles had done what some considered the impossible they beat the Dodgers at Chavez Ravine Incidentally, it was the first time the Dodgers had ever lost a World Series game in Dodger Stadium. Here's where the Scoppers had a field day. So the Orioles had won the first game, but all they had to fall back on was the bullpen again, and their luck couldn't last. In the second game, Palmer was starting against Koufax, and Koufax was only the best pitcher in baseball. He had clinched the Dodger pennant just four days earlier in Philadelphia. He had his rest. He was ready. But his teammates sold him down the river with the most comical display of oopsie-daisy ever seen in the World Series. To top it, Palmer pitched a four-hit shutout. The old pro Dodgers, the invincible Dodgers, cracked under the strain, and the birds took them to the cleaners. Palmer and Koufax hooked up in a scoreless duel until the fifth inning, Boog Powell got things rolling with a single. Not much, just a single. But then Paul Blair lofted a fly into center field, and Willie Davis apparently lost it in the sun. By the time things quieted down, Boog Powell had moved to third, and Paul Blair was safely at second. And then Andy Etchebarren hit another fly ball into center field. Whoops. 
again he dropped and then Davis overthrew third base and Paul Blair came in to score the second run. Etchebarren went to third and then Aparicio doubled him home with a shot down the line to left field. A three to nothing ball game in favor of the Orioles. But it didn't stay three to nothing. Ron Peronoski came on in relief for Sandy Koufax in the seventh. And he contributed to the whole business by throwing a ball past first base into the dugout. The Orioles kept on running, and by the time they stopped running, they had scored six runs. And Jim Palmer had pitched a four hitter, the youngest series pitcher ever to pitch a shutout. last out of the ball game that was it and the Dodgers were down by two games the first time in their history the Dodgers had lost two World Series games at Chavez Ravine the rest of the series coming up after this word from National Beer the Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a national beer here we are at the Peakness the Peakness yeah our annual crab race Wait a minute. Who can ride a tiny crab like that? A tiny, tiny jockey. Who else? They're in the gate, and they're off and running. Going to the front is cracked crab, followed by lemon slice, cold beer on the rail, and still in the gate, soft shell. Into the turn is cold beer on tap, cracked crab, lemon slice, and here comes soft shell. Into the stretch is cold beer and soft shell, soft shell and cold beer, and soft shell gets up and wins it. How about that soft shell? Soft shell goes good with a national beer. The Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a light beer, a beer that's easy to live with, national beer. So the Orioles had a two to nothing lead in games and the series was coming back to Baltimore 3,000 miles from Dodger Stadium into a ballpark where the Dodgers could get their base hits and score some runs said the experts but those experts weren't in the majority anymore the Orioles were now the betting favorites in the series each game was even money and on Thursday night or Friday morning if you want to call it that way the Orioles returned to Baltimore in a special charter. More than 7,000 screaming fans jammed Friendship Airport to get a look at their heroes. It was a cold night and a warm crowd. There were go-go girls dancing on car roofs and one worried fan who carried a sign begging the birds to lose at least one. He had tickets for the fifth game. And I don't think that there was one of those Orioles who in his heart of hearts didn't think that fan had a mighty good chance of seeing that fifth game. A few hours later, the Dodgers plane came to a stop at the same place at the airport and a plane load of lonely ball players was met by nobody but baggage attendants. After a day's rest, Walter Alston sent his club out on the field hoping to pull off last year's script again, coming back from a two-game deficit. It didn't work. Wally Bunker against Claude Osteen, game number three. A new record crowd of 54,445 packed Memorial Stadium for that third game, and Dick Brown, the former bird catcher, threw out the first ball. And the stage was set for the third quarter of what turned out to be a four-quarter affair. In the first inning, Kurt Bleffery clanked into the wall in the left field corner and held on to the ball for the big play of the game. Up to that point, a big out. In the second inning, the Orioles wiped out a Dodger threat with a quick double play. And here the Dodgers turned the same, same trick on the birds in the bottom of that inning. In the third, Aparicio got fielding honors with a beautiful effort on Kennedy's bid for a base hit. He threw him out. In the fourth, Wes Parker touched Bunker for a long ground rule double. Parker's best shot of the series, by the way, almost a home run. And frankly, Parker thought it was. Then the umpire chased him back to second base. It had bounced on the runway and into the crowd. The Willie Davis flied out for the second out of the inning, fairly walked, and the fever struck out. End of threat. Then in the bottom of the fifth inning, Paul Blair hit an Osteen pitch harder than he has ever hit a baseball before. Way back into the temporary bleachers in left center field. That made it a one to nothing ball game and apparently Wally Bunker agreed to the one run. He went out to protect. 
He got Lou Johnson to hit a grounder at Aparicio for the third and final out in the ninth inning and the ball game. Bunker had duplicated Jim Palmer's shutout of two days before. He had given the Dodgers only three hits, and he had extended the Orioles' shutout streak against Dodger batters for 24 consecutive innings, which isn't bad for a pitching staff that had been touted as poor at best. And so the Dodgers were down to their last life. The Orioles were building for a sweep if they could arrange it. The managers were coming back with their opening day pitchers, both of whom were touched in their first appearance. A Sunday ball game. And Sunday is the worst day for baseball attendance in Baltimore. But not this particular Sunday. Saturday's attendance record was broken wide open. 54,458 fans were squeezed into every available seat in the ballpark. And of course, all of us were looking to see if the Orioles could pull it off. If they didn't, they'd have to face Koufax the next day. As it turned out, Drysdale pitched well enough to win against anybody but the Orioles. Dave McNally pitched well enough to win against anybody, period. Through the first three innings, both pitchers were virtually untouchable. Drysdale gave up one hit, McNally none. Dave Johnson banged into a double play in the second inning to end a mild threat. Tommy Davis hit into a double play in the top of the fourth when the Dodgers had a man on. Mauricio to Johnson to Powell. In the bottom of the fourth, Drysdale committed one mistake, and Frank Robinson cashed in on it. The home run measured unofficially at 410 feet. It hit 10 rows from the back of the bleachers. His second home run of this particular series, both of them off Drysdale. It was 1-0 for the Orioles in the fourth inning, and that one run was forced to stand up. In the fifth, Lefevre let off with a single. McNally got Parker to hit into a double play. Kennedy let off the sixth with a single, and Echebaron cleaned him off with a strike to Aparicio as Drysdale struck out at the plate. No steal today. In the eighth, Paul Blair nearly duplicated a fantastic catch made by Willie Davis earlier in the game and almost in the same place. Jim Lefevre with a deep drive to center, but no cigar for him either. And then came the ninth with two men on base and Stu Miller warming in the bullpen. Paul Blair squeezed the final out into his glove and the baseball world had new champions. So the Orioles reign as champs of the boy baseball world until next October when they'll have to do it again. They didn't wait for someone to bestow the crown on their heads. They took it like Napoleon and crowned themselves. They wrenched it away from the defending champion Dodgers and used a baseball bat to threaten the former champs. They did it in four consecutive games. They got the good, no, great pitching, and they got timely hitting. For their efforts, they'll split the biggest series jackpot in history. For their part, the Dodgers will come back from the tour of Japan with more victories than they picked up in the series. And a check for about $8,000 will be waiting for each of them, which isn't bad play for losing four in a row. The players on the Oriole roster will get fat over the winter on the banquet circuit. Many of them will make a lot of extra money on speaking engagements, endorsements, and so on. And the Oriole front office will start a plan for next year, still savoring what's happened this time. In the locker room after the clincher, Jerry Hoffberger pretty much summed things up in a conversation with John Sterling. This is the leader in his first year, Rookie of the Year, Jerry Hoffberger. <laughs> John, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a happy rookie. I can As, guarantee you that. Can you imagine this? You, you're now champions. You're champions for the whole year. Yeah, you're right. Got a whole year to go, and then we start all over again. Could, you never could have dreamed this. No, I game. sure couldn't. And this pitching. No. Uh -uh. Uh, this you know, we pitch. didn't have any pitching. Isn't that no, what they I know that. Huh? The Orioles had bad yeah, pitching. Good hitting with bad yeah, pitching. That's right. Isn't right. that tremendous? And, you know, uh, nothing about our defense was ever said. You know, you've, you know? Uh, you've, you've mentioned so many times that you know that the Hopberger family has been in Baltimore for so many years, and you want to do this with Baltimore. And, you know, Baltimore, that's a King City now in sports. For this well, you know, that's what I said in the, down in Florida. I really did want to do it for Baltimore. Uh, we've, we've taken a lot out of the town. We wanted to give something back. I think maybe this is a piece of I kind of think so.
Maris is ready. Here's the pitch. It's going, going, it's in there. A new Major League record, 61 home runs by Roger Maris. Hi, kids. That sure was a day for me. Part of the thrill of baseball. The kind of real excitement I've put into my great new game by Pressman, Action Baseball. The score is 2-2. You're up at bat. The pitcher set, and he can pitch. Fastball, slow ball, curve. Here it comes. A hot single to right. And the next one, uh-oh, a strike. The pitch, a smashing double to left field. Another run batted in. All the skill and excitement of World Series when you play Roger Maris Action Baseball by Pressman. Now you can hit home runs just like Roger Maris. Yes, kids. There's nothing like the thrill of baseball. And now it's yours. Get Roger Maris Action Baseball today. 298. Oh boy, a Pressman toy.